This is another special bonus episode of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Fly Fishing Founder Series where you hear behind the scenes stories from the companies who are going all in on fly fishing. This week we have Proof Fly Fishing with Matt Draft. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Today's episode is sponsored by Proof Fly Fishing, who is one of our partner companies in the Wet Fly Swing Member Society. You get uh, exclusive discounts from Proof Fly Fishing and over 30 other partner companies who are helping to support your journey. Go to wetflyswing.com slash members to uh, support the podcast and to build your first rod or to fix an old rod. In today's episode, I uh, talk with uh, Matt Draft, the guy behind Proof Fly Fishing. We talk about how Matt built a full-time business teaching people about rod building and providing products and supplies needed to build their first rods. Uh, We talk about the exact steps it takes to uh, get into building a Euronymph rod, uh, how fiberglass compares to graphite, and some upcoming uh, new products from Proof. Don't miss this one as Matt talks about the differences between his rod blanks and some of the bigger companies that are out there. And we even uh, hear about a little bit of a Walmart special, which is always uh, which is always a lot of fun. So without further ado, here's Matt Draft from ProofFlyFishing.com. How's it going, Matt? It's going well, Dave. How are you? Great. Great to have you on the show here. We, uh, we're going to get into some on uh, rod building. You have a company that's definitely got a good name out there. I've been hearing about you from people, listeners of the show and other companies. So I'm, I'm excited to jump into that. Before we get into all the rod building and the how-tos, maybe you can talk about how you first got into fly fishing and then, and then into the rod building. Sure. Uh, well, fly fishing, I guess I started when I was um, in my late teens. Um, I grew up next to a trout unlimited uh, river in Michigan, Southwest Michigan. And yeah, honestly, uh, mostly self-taught. I had a fly rod, just a real cheap one. I think I picked up from Walmart originally and uh, we fished it every single day for, for years on end. And it wasn't until years later that I kind of picked up fly tying. And um, then once in college, we kind of moved a little bit more into the uh, rod building phase of, of the sport. Mm -hmm. What did the, um, um, I, I wanted to touch on that, uh, the Walmart raw that I I love, I love hearing the Walmart stories, Uh, (laughs) but you know, so how do you just, uh, let's see. And I'm trying to think of the time. So when you picked up rod building, what were there, could you, could you pretty much just go on YouTube and learn everything you need to know there or or how did, you know, what, what tipped you? Why not, why not fly tying or, you know, why are the, why the rod building? Sure. Um, I was part of a, a couple different email lists, and there was a, a pretty large rod building forum at the time. It's since um, gone away. But honestly, you know, it's it's just been kind of... Uh, what was that rod building? Do you remember the name of uh, it? It was rodbuildingforum.com. Oh, there but you go. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much gone at this point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of stuff has kind of moved over to YouTube, some of it to Facebook, Um but yeah, all the information in the in the group is mainly still out there, just kind of in different places. Okay. Okay. Good. So yeah, there's a resource. So you had had that forum, and then and then what was the? You also mentioned the TU uh, a TU River in Michigan. What, what what's the TU River? Uh, it's uh, Trout Unlimited. It's a protected river called the Coldwater. That was kind of my local river, um, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, it was close. You know, I could ride my bike there. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, just great place just to get away and uh, kind of learn how to how to fly fish. Gotcha. Okay, and then and then the Walmart rod. This is a really interesting thing that occasionally the you know this pops up. But you know, how, if you could, had to compare that Walmart rod to say the rods that that you have in your in your lineup, you know, what's the <laughs> what's the big what's the big difference? Or you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, first, I remember it having like an EVA grip on it, so that's kind of what sticks in my mind the oh, most like about plastic. That. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Um, and then, I, boy, it's been a long time since I've—I don't even know what happened to that rod, but I remember it being pretty soft and not being able to control it real well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's probably the biggest difference between some of the the real low ends kind of older rods and more modern glass or modern graphite yeah. or glass 
But uh, it's just the, the level of control you have with yeah. that rod. And some of that comes from uh, just building the skill up as well. I think you put a, a Walmart rod in the hands of someone who knows what they're doing. And, you know, we might right. all be surprised at what it can do. That's true. Yeah, that's true. They're, they're, you know, I always wonder about that because there's, yeah, there's so many different rods out there. And, and we'll touch on some of the stuff, you know, on, on your blanks and, and that today. But, yeah, it's interesting to hear, you know, kind of but again just getting started it doesn't matter you know really whether it's a walmart rod or whatever the main thing is to get a rod in your hand you know your hand and get out there and start flailing away right absolutely cool all right well um yeah maybe we'll swing back around to some of the michigan stuff i I know um there's definitely there's always some good questions i've had a a number of guests we've had some steelhead episodes and things like that on, on michigan but but yeah let's jump into the rod building so Maybe you can take me to, you know, obviously you're a huge resource if people want to get, jump in and learn about it. So maybe we could just start there. If, if, if I'm new to it, you know, I haven't built a rod, I want to build my first rod. What are the steps, you know, let's, let's talk about just going through your, you know, your process or, or how would I connect with you and then, and get a rod built and how would I know where to start? Sure. Um, I think the best place to start would be with uh, like a component kit. So it's going to have, you know, one of the tricky pieces about building a rod is that there's all different size and styles of guides and reel seats and grips out there. And when you just get started, it can be a little bit overwhelming as far as, you know, what size tip top you need versus a stripping guide and all the sizes of snake guides. Mm -hmm. Um, So what a kit does is take all of those complexities and we handle that side of it. Um, so what you get is a kit where every piece matches and the real seat's going to fit the grip and the grip's going to fit the rod and, you know, all, from okay. top to bottom, you know, it takes the guesswork out of it. Okay. So th- that's probably where I'd start. Yep. So if I had um, a, if I wanted to get into say, uh, do you guys do, um, a Euro nipping rods and stuff like that? We do. Yeah. We currently have one and I have another one in production that should be shipping next week. I'm hoping. Okay. So if I wanted to get into a Euro nymphing rod and say I'm new to Euro nymphing, but I, I know I want kind of a longer rod, what would the, what would you recommend? Um, you know, you, you, so you have a kit that's ready to go. We do. Yeah. We have a, a, a 10 foot. That's a three slash four weight, um, specifically a check nymphing rod. Mm-hmm. That um, yeah, and then you can fully customize it too, depending on like um, the type of guides you want, uh, the grip, reel seat, all those okay. different things. And, but, and so so okay, so you have this, um, you can customize it. So you have this rod. And I guess that's the first thing on the rod. Now, how does that all? Where do you get your rods? And how do you you know? I mean, could somebody bring in another blank if they had a blank? Or and then here's another question: If they had an old rod that they liked that was kind of falling apart you know, could they strip that down and then kind of use some of your components? Would you recommend that as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a large part of our business. It's just people who might have a rod they found in a garage sale or maybe their, you know, uh, their grandfather's rod and they want to redo it. It's missing some guides. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we offer a service. Uh, I think it's on our guides and hardware select section where if you, you can send us, there's a form there and you can submit the form with as much information as you know about the the rod that you're currently working on. Maybe it's just the length and the line weight. And what we'll do is we'll reply to that with a a, a suggestion for guide sizes, um, grip, reel seat, everything from top to bottom as far as what you'll need to kind of redo that rod. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Cool. So yeah, that's, that's good to know. So if you have some old gear, you can kind of go through that route. Um, And then, and so everything's there at the site. Now, if I have, so let's go back to that Euro nymphing rod. So I'm going to start out with the, the rod. Uh, and then, so when you start to think about the, you know, the, I say the cork, the handle, how do you know wh- what to choose for a handle? I mean, you, everybody has different size hands. Where, where do you start there? Sure. Well, there's a couple of considerations. One is going to be the length and line weight of the rod. So usually the shorter the rod, um, the shorter the handle you're going to want on it or the grip. Okay. So especially in fiberglass, sometimes you'll get into some real short grips um, down to even like five inches. Whereas in graphite, I think the standard is going to be seven inches. Mm -hmm. Uh, But as far as grip shape, you know, uh, I think right now the majority of fly rods have a reverse half wells on them. But we try to offer some older grips. We have a Ritz grip, Fenwick, mm-hmm. um, cigars. What is a, just a what is a reverse of reverse half wells versus a yeah, like a cigar is another type, right? 
It is. Yep. Uh, reverse half wells is going to have kind of a wider end toward the back um, yep. where the wheel seat meets up. Yeah. And then a swell and then it tapers quite narrow to the front. Whereas a cigar just kind of has a, a yeah. gradual. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, it's pretty, it's an even grip, but it yeah. just has a, you know, in the front. That's right. That's right. Okay, cool. And I'll have some links in the show notes to, you know, some information on here, what we're talking about and links to your site and things like that. So, okay. So we're getting started. So we, we can kind of figure out, you know, the rod and again, and then back to the rod. So what do we need to know about rod blanks? I mean, obviously if it's a kit, you kind of send it out, but you know, when thinking about rod blanks, how do we know when we maybe want to get a new rod blank or when we want to just rebuild that, that old rod, I guess it's just kind of a user preference, right? It is to some extent. Sure. I mean, if you're looking for something a little more specific, uh, like a longer nymphing rod, or if you want to fish some real small water, um, with real delicate tippet, yeah. then, uh, yeah, then, you know, it's going to, I think the first question is what material do you want your blank made out right. of? Um, we've seen a pretty big resurgence in fiberglass these days. Do you do both? I do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yep. you can get a fiberglass, uh, Euro rod. Uh, not Euro, sorry, yeah. but, um, we do have shorter ones. Uh-huh. Yeah. I think, and this is personal preference and some people would would take issue with this, but I think glass kind of excels in the shorter line in the shorter lengths. Oh, okay. Um, is that because it, it has gets, more flexibility, more bend? It does. Yep. And then for me, it just gets a little bit heavy when you start getting, you know, above nine feet. Um, oh, it does. But really? Yeah. That's, that's my, my take though. Sure. And, you know, no, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, because it is, I mean, that's the, I remember, well, back in the day, right. If you're old enough to remember, you know, there was, there was fiberglass and then graphite came on. Uh, well, there was those old fiberglass, which were actually good rods, and they were like super fat. Do you remember? I mean, have you seen any of those? You know, the yep. super, yeah, right. So that was the original, these super fat, but they were good rods, I think, at the time. And then, and then I think graphite came in, right? Is that is that how it worked? Or maybe you can break down. That's Do right. you know a little bit of that history there? Uh, not enough to speak too yeah. intelligently about it, but um, but yeah, you're right. Um, you know, graphite first we started with bamboo, and then we switched over to graph or to fiberglass. Yeah. And then more modern graphite's pretty much taken over, um, yep. even with the popularity of, of glass and today. Why, why do you it's, think glass? So you think glass has come in, uh, returned here with the kind of resurgence because, you know, because of that short game, or why do you think it's it just people want to just mix it up a little bit? Um, a couple of reasons. I think uh, graphite as a whole, the, the blanks became too fast. Oh yeah. And and um, fiberglass just offers a, a wonderful feel when you cast, um, you know, unparalleled tippet protection. And uh, I think just kind oh, of right. a hallmark, for, like some of the, the older days of, of fly fishing, right? Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Well, let's keep moving along here. So we got this, you know, back to this Euro, this Euro nymph rod. We got, you know, so we got this package. So I'm going to go to your website and I'm going to click through and, and find this. I'm going to order it. It's, it's going to be delivered now. How do I get into the next steps? I got this rod kit, but what do I need? Um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, all the other stuff, you know, the, 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 how do I choose the thread, the, you know, what about holding it when you're spinning it? I know when I used to build rods, we had a, you know, a, a, mo- a motor powered a rod spinner, right? So you can slowly sure. as you, with the glue, maybe you can walk through that whole thing, what you need there and, and how we get that. Sure. Um, I tend to be a bit of a minimalist when it comes to equipment. I think a lot of times we can get kind of uh, too uh, consumed with mm-hmm. like, you know, what we're going to use to make the rod. So yeah. I try to keep things as simple as possible. Um, in the On our website, in addition to just picking up products, what we have are a, um, a good series of tutorials that depending on the, pr- on the rod you're building, they'll kind of take you through every step of the process. Um, and then we also offer a couple kits as far as just kind of if you if you have no you know no if you're not sure what you might need to kind of get started tool wise and like epoxy and thread and stuff like that we offer two different kits one for um, bamboo and fiberglass and then one for graphite okay um, that'll have literally everything you need to get started oh yeah I see it yeah so I'm looking at it now you got the graphite tool and finish kit yep yep and that's okay and that's uh, yeah, so it looks like, yeah, you've got the little, you've got a wooden uh, rod holder that you, I guess, um, when you're wrapping. And, and so maybe you can get into, well, I guess when you start a rod, what, what's the first, is, is maybe you st- start us with the first step when we get into building it. What, what are we doing? Maybe you can walk us through quickly on that. 
Yeah, I guess the first step you want to do is um, figure out which side of the blank you want to build, you know, wrap the guides on. Um, now, again, with modern rods, it's a little, uh, I, in my opinion, a little less important than in some older rods as far as finding the spline, which is kind of a natural, relaxed state of the blank. Oh, yeah. Um, but we'll walk you through that in some of the tutorials. But basically, you want to you want to get maximum benefits and, um, and straightness out of your cast, and that's going to begin with which side of the blank you wrap the guides on. Um, in modern blanks, I think a lot of builders will um, just build on the straightest axis, so they'll assemble the blank and then kind of eyeball it, rotate it, and find the straightest line, and they'll build on that line. How do you assemble the blank when you get the blank? You know, I mean, usually are the, are, and are these, is this, say this zero rod, is this going to be a four piece or, or what do you have here? Or do you, and do you uh, do like two pieces at all? You know, I don't do two piece right now. Um, I do four piece. Um, a lot of the fiberglass are three. Yeah. And then I also have a, I think seven piece travel rod it doesn't right seem now. Like, I guess the two piece was kind of an old school thing as well. Like what, what would be an advantage of having a two piece rod? Um, some people say the action is a little bit smoother. Sure. But today with modern feral design, um, yeah. honestly, I don't think there's any difference at all. Gotcha. Okay. So, so good. So now, but when you get that rod, how do you know, um, you know, the, the spline or is it, is it the spline? Is that the correct term? It is. Yeah. The yep. spline is the bend. So basically when you put the rod, they all have some sort of a little bit of a bend in them. And how do you know when to put those, the ferals together to get all the bend straight? <laughs> That's a great question. It's really hard to explain. Um, you have a video no. though on it, right? I do have a video on it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you'll rest it on the table and you can't spline all the parts. Usually, um, usually in a two piece rod, you can just because you have the length and the flexibility in each yeah. section, but with multi piece rods and the th you know, four and above those sections just get too short to, to discern, um, you know, the flex profile, but, uh, you can usually spline at least the tip and maybe the section below it. And then, you know, beyond that, I, I don't think it becomes Doesn't important. Matter. I got you. Okay. Yeah. And I'm looking at your video series now at, uh, uh, on your website and, um, yeah, you got a whole bunch. I mean, how to build a fiberglass rod, um, grips, alignment dots. Um, yeah, you got all sorts. You got, it looks like you got all covers. So this is great. Um, okay. So you got the spline, you set that up and when you set that up, you want to set it up. So the, you know, once you have the real seat, you know, on there and all that, that the real would be basically on the well how would you explain that because you got two ways the bend is uh it's kind of con concave is, is that how you'd, you'd um yeah how would you yeah. say that yep yeah that's yeah exactly um yeah so what, once you get the guides kind of wrapped on what you're doing is kind of creating a map that's going to work itself all the way down the blank so i usually start with a tip top i install the tip top and that becomes kind of my definitive guide all right and then yeah. everything else lines up to it Yep. So as I work down the various sections, I'll end with, you know, if I'm using a hook keeper, the hook keeper will be aligned with the guides, which are all aligned with the tip top. Yep. And then the reel as well has an inlet that's going to receive the guide foot. And you certainly want to make sure that that's in the right place as well. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah, so then and you get into all the wrapping and we're not going to get into all the details there. They can take a look at the video, sure. you know, your videos yeah. and stuff there. But, but, you know, one of the big part, you know, wrapping obviously is, you know, that definitely is a, an art. I mean, I know, you know, I, I've built a few rods. It's been a long, long time actually, but you know, I was never great, you know, or like, you know, some of these rods you see, there's, it's amazing, right? It's like artwork, the wraps people yeah. are doing. And I remember, you know, my brother was a great rod builder and he used to wrap these designs into him. You know, if you want to get to that level, I mean, can you, as a beginner, just jump in and follow a tutorial to figure out how if to do that, or, or should you just basically do your normal, just straight wraps to start off with? Uh, it kind of depends on what you're looking for. Um, you know, I offer some tutorials on doing some of the uh, more intricate wraps. What would that be called but, if, if you're, and if somebody wanted to find that, what would that be called uh, online? Uh the the more like decorative wraps you mean yeah or, like, you know what I'm talking about they got like diet you know, diet people all do all sorts of stuff right yeah on fly rods I think you you tend to you're, it tends to be a little bit more simplistic oh, and, okay. and I think it goes back to the history but yeah if you see some of the like the larger um, saltwater rods and stuff like that they'll have diamond patterns yeah and the diamond stuff right real, real elaborate so you don't um, see that you don't see that at all in in most fly rods they're pretty straightforward. That's right. Yep. And what you might get are like inlay bands. So like single turn inlays, which is, um, tough, which is hard to do too, right? 
They certainly can be. Yeah. You know, um, like anything, it takes a bit of practice. Um, but yeah, a tutorial is a great way to start. It'll kind of show you how to do it, but then yeah, it just takes time at the bench to kind of, you know, work it out. Gotcha. Okay. And some of these things you see, um, kind of clear, I mean, you can see the guide, the bottom, what, what's the base of the guide called that you're wrapping your thread on? Uh, the, that, oh, the guide the foot? foot. Is that the foot? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So some of these you can see you wrap it, but the thread is so clear you see the foot. What what is that? That is that a pretty common thing to see, and is that just the thread, the type of thread uh, you're it, using? It is. Yep. Uh, well, it's going to happen to all thread. Um, if you're using nylon or silk, um, you'll see the guide foot um, through the thread once you apply finish on it. Mm -hmm. Unless you're using um, something called color preserver, which um, makes right. the thread opaque. And you can buy thread that has that it is impregnated with that color preserver, um, or you can apply it after the wrap is is laid down. Okay, okay, cool. And I'm just looking through again on that uh, on your web page, the graphite tool finish kit, and you know that you have the rod holder, the little wooden rod holder, which is is how you spin it. So, and how so when you're when you start to wrap the guides with the thread, you have your rod sitting in the rod holder. Um, you know, where is your thread? How are you wrapping that? Is the thread being, you know, how is the thread being held? Because I remember, again, that was one where you would, where I used to do it, you would have some sort of tension on the thread between the, the, That's the right. yeah, is that still the case? Absolutely. Yeah. And again, this is kind of where I come back to, I like a real simple approach. So, you know, there are a lot of different mechanical tensioners you can use, some yep. tension the thread, some the spool, you know, and there's debates over which is best. But um, I usually take the spool of thread, throw it in a coffee cup, and then run the thread itself through a book. Oh, yeah. And yeah, the weight of the book and the friction on the page that's awesome. creates the, the tension. That's awesome. Yeah, you, that's so cool. I mean, this is a total kind of a DIY sort of thing. You know, it's great because, yeah, the tensioner, and I've, I've, I could probably find an old one from the old shop that I, you know, we have here, but, um, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, that thing might cost you now a hundred bucks, right? To buy it. And you can still buy those tensioners. Oh, yeah. And you can spend way more than that, you know? It's, yeah. uh, and then trying to dial them in and, uh, switch spools and then you have to dial them in again. You know, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. yeah, it can just that's take a lot cool. of time. Where does the book, idea you know can you talk a little bit about uh you know i mean is this something where you just read up on it a long time ago or is this an idea that's pretty common out there using a book uh i think it's been around for a long time um i think it's you know before people kind of were you know had the space and uh to wrap rods at an actual bench a lot of people would just wrap them by hand so they'd either have a thread and like a, a fly tying bobbin or something or just kind of tension between their legs and would wrap the rod while holding it. But yeah. it gets pretty tricky. You know, it takes a lot of dexterity to be able to manage that, that many things and do it well. Right. So what I wanted to do was kind of find an approach that um, really anybody could use. If you didn't have a lot of space, then you can do it at your, you know, your dining room table um, or at just any desk that you might have available. And so in order to do that, it needed to be small and it needed to be have as many components as, you know, things you might just have laying around the house. Gotcha. Yeah, that's awesome. So, and then if you want, that's the cool thing with the book, you just want more tension, just put it deeper in the book with more weight on it. Exactly. There you go. Yep. That's cool. Okay. So, and just finishing up the, the uh, graphite tool kit here. So you got the rod holder, you got, um, it looks like you got the couple of glues, different glues you, and, um, some different tape, some green tape, some masking tape. Um, and what's the, uh, what's the little, there's kind of a little, uh, there's a couple of tools. What are the metal tools that come with the kit? The uh, there's two of them. One is just a stainless steel spatula. And for that kit, you're going to use that to mix like a two part epoxy, which will be put over top of the thread to seal it and protect it. Oh, is that the rod, uh, rod dancer ultimate epoxy five? Um, that's actually, um, that's an epoxy that you're going to use to, uh, put the grip and reel seat on. Oh, but right. the yeah, the epoxy is going to be Threadmaster. It's kind of a two-part, and then it becomes crystal clear when you mix them together. Gotcha. Part, uh, part A resin. And this is cool. On your side, I'm zoomed in, um, and you obviously have some sweet, great quality photos because I'm zoomed in and, and can read all the fine print. Oh, excellent. That's nice work on that. Um, so, yeah, I see it. The Threadmaster light formula, um, part thinner viscosity. Yeah, so, okay, so that's – and where do you get – so where do you get all this stuff? Are these all specific different companies you're getting this stuff from? 
They are. You know, the fun thing I think about one, you know, the rod building industry is that it's it's made up of just dozens and dozens of small companies. Oh, no kidding. And so, yeah, I, I, I'd probably work with, I don't know, three dozen different suppliers throughout uh, the U.S. and the world um, wow. to get different pieces. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors, the Wet Fly Swing Member Society and Proof Fly Fishing. If you have been enjoying the podcast episodes and want to support small businesses and get some bonus content, then you need to check out uh, our member society. For about the price of a pint of beer, you get inside access and exclusive discounts to over 30 of our partner companies. Proof Fly Fishing is one of those great companies who is going all in on an innovative idea and providing you with exclusive discounts. I originally reached out to many of our listeners of the podcast and asked them who their favorite small to mid-sized companies were. I then reached out to those companies, and that's how the group was made. You can connect with our our community, support local businesses, and join the movement at one convenient location. Go to wetflyswing.com slash members to check out all the details. That's wetflyswing.com slash M-E-M-B-E-R-S to support the movement, the podcast, and your journey. Now, is this your full-time job? You know, right now it is. Um, for a long time, uh, for the last probably... 13 or 14 years, this kind of been yeah running in the background. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, you know, my wife decided to go back to graduate school and we needed the flexibility. And I thought, well, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to give this a shot and, yeah. and see how it goes. How so, long have you been, uh, has this been your full-time gig? Uh, it's been just over three years now. Oh, wow. That's, that's amazing. I love, yeah. we've, we've got into some stories here over the, you know, the last couple of years on, Occasionally, just hear. I love hearing the stories because you know you, you get all different, you know, and in the jumping off point. So, you know, d- that three years ago when you jumped off, what, what did that feel like? Um, uh, that's yeah, a little uncomfortable in some ways, yep. just because I was like, "Gosh, can I really make this work?" Right. And, uh, but you know, it, it, proof fly fishing has always been something that um, I've never really needed to make much money on and i still don't yeah. so it's something i enjoy doing gotcha, and gotcha. it's grown slowly but steadily and so i don't really i don't advertise i don't worry too much about the numbers right now i just kind of just have fun yeah just have fun and you Teach know get people. to know people yep yeah no it's a pretty it is and that's why i'm kind of getting on this a little because i had uh, you know meat market flies um on oh uh, yeah yeah and uh and it was a similar thing where we started chatting about it. And I said, you know, they do, I didn't realize it, but they are literally only streamers, mostly streamers. And that's just talking about a niche because, you know, all these niches down, you know, you got fly fishing is already tiny, but you're, yes. you're niching down into, they niche down into fly tying and then into just streamers. I know it's and, wild, isn't it? Isn't it wild? And you just think, God, how the heck do you, how do you do it? But, it, but I think you can do it as long as you, you know, you kind of have that passion, you enjoy it and you just find a way. And it sounds like that's kind of what you're doing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's been a lot of fun. That's cool. And how many other companies are out there doing, um, doing the same, a similar sort of thing? Is there just a, a handful in the U S yeah. Yep. Yeah, there's uh, a couple like what I'd call big box shops that do it. And then there's, uh, maybe two or three smaller ones similar to mine. Mm-hmm. A lot of them will specialize, like in bamboo. I think I can uh, the couple that I'm thinking of. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yep. Well, I had, and I had here a question. Um, I, I'm going to mention this later, probably towards the end. But um, you know, the Wet Fly Swing Members Society group I have going. I had a question here, Dan, who's in the group. Um, I mentioned you were coming on, and and he was just talking. He just had a general question, and this is actually a good one about ice spacing. And, and your stripping guide and stuff like that. I know when I used to build well, build a few rods, um, I would just compare it to a previous rod and have the spacing on it. Um, when you're doing this, is that pretty much what you do? You have it all set up? Or is there any reason to change that stripping guide or, or make them different you know, uh, distances between the two? Yeah, you know, there are a lot of different theories out there as far as guide spacing, and it's related to the number of guides that you have on the blank. Which typically um, is one guide per foot. Uh, plus one. Plus yeah. One. So, yeah. um, yeah, like a nine foot rod should have, you know, 10 guides on it plus the tip top. Um, but yeah, um, I, I kind of take a middle of the road, so I don't like to put too many guides on like on a nine foot rod. I might put 10, maybe an 11th guide if I, 
if I feel like that would benefit, it would benefit from that. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. but yeah, um, yeah, I use the guide spacing program. Um, it's, it's based, um, on, uh, Chris Carlin is a big bamboo rod builder in the oh. U S and, uh, so I use, I use a program that he developed and yeah, I think it's based on Clemens program. The math is kind of like a little too complicated yeah. for me to figure out, but, <laughs> but he's got it all dialed in. So I kind of rely on his. Okay. Is Chris Carlin, uh, does he have a website out there or what, what is his deal? He does. Yep. He does. Uh, I think he's based in Alaska and he's one of the, yeah, one of the premier bamboo rod builders in the country. So oh, nice. Def- nice. Yeah. Oh. And I'll, I'll put a link, I'll find his uh, website and put a link, uh, in the show notes. What, what, um, and do you do a little bit of bamboo? I do. Yeah. I actually started with bamboo. So, um, Yep, I'll occasionally build the blank, but right now I just don't have the time to get into them too much. But uh, I do a fair amount of restoration on bamboo for different people. Oh yeah, so there yeah, you go. That's, yeah. Kind of a- that's the thing. Somebody probably brings in an old, uh, you know, an old Orvis bamboo or something kind of cool like that, and yeah, that would be amazing, right? Restoring some old fifty-year-old rod or something. Or what's the oldest rod you've ever worked on? Uh, probably about a hundred-year-old rod. No kidding. Yep, and I have one coming that I think is even older than that. So, what, what was the history? What was that rod? Do you know? Uh, you know, I just talked to the person yesterday, so yeah. they're shipping it to me now, and uh, it looks like it's in pretty rough shape. Oh, so really? we'll have to look at it and, and see what we can do. But it's a salmon rod, so that'll be kind of oh, fun. Oh wow! Yeah, I remember that's one of those things where I know my dad was kind of an old bamboo rod, uh, you know, connoisseur, or at least knew a lot about them. And I remember back in the day, he, you know, people would bring him in to the shop a lot of them you know they have these old bamboo rods and yeah i never learned all the details but i remember one of them was kind of the coloration you could tell how the quality of the rod you know i think back in the day the darker colored bamboos were you know may, maybe part of it do you know on a bamboo rod today what what separates i mean i guess there's some companies making them but could can you just get a a bamboo blank right because people are also making the full on you know i know i've had a couple of guests that were literally making all the way from the blank everything Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what yeah. I was doing. Oh, yeah, so you're started, doing that. Yeah, you're doing the whole thing. Yep. Started with just a column of bamboo, and we'd split it and then yep. rough it out. And then, yep, it's quite a process. But, yeah, there are a lot of um, suppliers. I think I, I mentioned Chris Carlin earlier. Yeah. He sells blanks uh, as well as fully built bamboo rods. Okay. Um, but as far as separating the quality, I think, you know, there's a craftsmanship component to it um, as far as, you know, having no glue lines, no chips in the, the nodes when you're, uh, um, you know, putting those strips together. All right. And then you just have the quality of, um, of glue you're using. Uh, there, there's some folks that have been importing uh, bamboo blanks from, from overseas. And that's where I think you're going to notice the biggest difference is the quality of the bamboo itself. And then the glue that they're using, mm. uh, it just does not have uh, oh. feel to it. It just feels too soft and, oh, yeah. and like sliding around a bit on you. That's right. And and is there something where, I think I heard about this, where, you know, in the bamboo that you can actually, what do you, hollow out the middle or something like that, where it changes the action? Is that is that a thing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of times people do it to reduce weight on um, longer or heavier weight rods. Um, but yeah, I think you can certainly crisp up the action a little bit. What you're removing from the inside of the uh, the strips is the pith, which is kind yep. of a soft and yep. spongy material. That's right. And is that typically on all bamboo rods? Do they try to remove that pith or is a lot of them, no. do they leave it? No, I think uh, hollowing is, from my understanding, a fairly new technique um like i when i built rods i never hollowed any of them um but uh yeah yeah, i think it's just more of a newer thing to save weight gotcha okay and and what is um what is the biggest question you get from people out there that are reaching out when they're trying to build their first rod uh let me think or or maybe the most common or just something that you you know a thing you feel um you know, on a regular, yeah. I, I think about for me, it seems, I mean, I've got a bunch of questions I have on it, but you know, just for sure. a beginner. Probably the biggest question I get is how to start the thread up on the guide foot because oh, you're yeah. dealing with like pretty small tolerances there. Oh, you mean on the very, when you're dealing with a small on the very tip or not the tip, but the first guide or second guide. It, you know, honestly, it doesn't even matter which guide. It's just kind of getting the thread up um, onto the guide. So and that just takes a little bit of practice. I do a couple tutorials where I kind of explain a couple different techniques on how to overcome that. 
like yep. kind of starting up on the guide and then pushing the thread down. Cool. Um, but yeah, I think it's just a matter of, you know, it, it, it's a new skill, kind of like tying flies, you know, it's like, how do I wrap hackle, right? Well, you got to, yeah, a few techniques and then it just, just takes practice. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And, uh, yeah. And, and that's, I'm excited to dig into the tutorials as well, because I, you've got a, I've got a, a spay rod that you've, uh, you've sent me. I actually haven't seen it yet. I'm, I'm out, uh, out of town, but, um, you know, I'm excited to dig into your videos on that. And it, like I said, it's been a long time since I built a rod, so this is going to be fun. I hopefully will be able to maybe video or track some of my, you know, my journey on it because, you know, I'm hopeful that it'll, it'll look good. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll put some links in the show notes to, to that stuff as well down the line. Um, Excellent. yeah, so that'll be fun. Okay. So, you know, back to, I guess the rod. So are we missing anything here? I mean, I kind of, we walked through a little bit on it. Is there anything you'd like to touch on? You know, obviously it's all, you know, you have the tutorials, but just, you know, to help somebody get started or, or maybe just, maybe they're sitting here listening to this wondering why would I want to build a rod? I mean, I can just go buy one. Would yeah. It, no, you know, I, why, why I would somebody want to build a rod? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, a couple of reasons. One, I think you'll understand every other fly rod that you have or will have much better if you can understand how they're put together. Um, you know, when you're in a rod shop or a fly shop or something and you're looking at a rod, it'll, once you've built one, you can look at the thread, you can look at the grip, and you'll notice things that you've never noticed before. Um, and if you have, you know, if your rod gets damaged, you know, instead of spending, you know, 40, $50 yeah, to ship it in, you can fix it yourself for just there a couple go. dollars or nothing at all. Yep. Um, That's true. And you, and the cool thing is, is, uh, you know, it's, it's a thing you built. I mean, it's your, it's your creation kind of similar to fly tying. Um, and you absolutely. can put your name on it. Do you have any tips when you're writing your, um, you know, I know that's one cool thing, you know, you can kind of write, maybe call, you know, have a name for the rod or put your name on it, you know, because I, again, that used to be something I struggled at. Can you, uh, what would you recommend that if somebody wanted to make something really cool sure. down by the, the, um, by the, you know, the handle? Sure. What I would suggest is before you glue the handle in place, um, use that area that's going to be covered up to practice on mm. that way, you know, you can, you know, mess it up as much as you want and it's and, not going to matter because the what group's going to. What do you uh, use? What do you use for the uh, the pin? Because I don't see a pin in your in your kit here, but for doing that, there's not a kit. Or yeah, there's not one included in the kit because all my all my blanks come with like labels. Oh, labels. Uh, okay. But, but uh, we do sell a range of India ink, so you'll definitely want it, India ink is an archival ink. It's permanent and it just doesn't smear like other inks might. Okay. And how do you write on what, what's the pin utensil? Or, uh. You know, I mean, are you using like a, a calligraphy pen or how do you write? Oh, uh, nope. The, uh, the India ink is just, it's like a drafting pencil. So it oh, okay. pen. yeah, it's all self-contained. So self-contained. If I wanted to get one of those, you can, do you, you have those on your site or you have to just go we do. somewhere? Yeah. Yep. We have those on the site. Yeah. Some people will use like a calligraphy pen with, uh, various like acrylics. Yep. And I've always had a hard time getting the acrylic to flow right. So exactly. Me too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I usually stick to India ink. Okay, and just finishing up the uh, the the tools or the little kit here. So you got the glues. You got um, what's the other tool? You got a little wooden handled point uh, pointed tool. Yeah, um, it's called a burnishing tool, and I use that. It's kind of like a third hand when you're wrapping guides. So you can use the tip of it to kind of you know maneuver thread if you have a loose thread or if it's not you know, uh, looking tight, you can pack that thread. Oh, right. Instead of using then, your, your nail or something like that. Exactly. Yep. It's just a little bit easier. It gives you a little finer, uh, finer touch on the wrap. Okay. And then you got a little pack of uh, razor blades, which is key. Yep. Um, okay, good. Well, and, um, yeah. So again, back to that, are we, uh, anything we're missing here as far as, you know, a little bit of tips or anything to know? Do you, do you have any kind of a, maybe your cop, uh, top couple tips to somebody's building their first rod, what you would, what you would tell them? Um, I think I would say just, you know, enjoy the process. You know, um, there's, there's a lot of, uh, talking, you know, on like Instagram pictures of people having these like perfect, beautiful wraps and right. it, it doesn't have to be that, you know, just to be, Take a relaxed stance to it, you know, enjoy the process. You know, your first rod's not going to be perfect and you kind of have to make your peace with that up front. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's going to fish just as well 
as, you know, someone with perfect wraps and, you know, once right. you're on the water, that's the last thing you want to worry about. Right. Yeah, totally. Well, and I just want to finish up just back. So the guides that, that definitely wrapping the guide. So on the real seat and the handle, is that process still the same where you, you kind of go, well, I mean, I guess you don't necessarily yours. If with the kit, you wouldn't have to ream it out because it's all, it's already set, but are you still wrapping, you know, under the guide and the real seat wrapping the, the masking tape? you know, to build it up and using epoxy or what, can you explain that quickly, that little sure. process? Yeah. Um, well the, the most grips are going to come with a standard bore of between a quarter inch and uh, three eighths of an inch. So depending on the blank, you will have to open that up. And I just use a rat tail file again, something a lot of people have around and what should that allow you to do is get a real custom fit for that grip. You don't want a lot of um, kind of, open space under the grip uh-huh. um, and if you have that if the grip you have is reamed out or the blank is quite small then yeah you can build the grip up with um, rows of masking tape mm-hmm. and uh, that's the same for the real seat yes yeah, and then why the you have the green masking tape and the other the two colors yeah the uh the standard masking tape it's just a narrow masking tape and that's what we'll use to kind of shim out the real seats and the grips and the green masking tape is an eighth inch. Um, it's a silicone free tape and we'll use that to hold the guides in place while we wrap them. Oh, okay. Gotcha. All right. Um, well, you know, I think that, you know, obviously, like we said, there's a lot of this stuff we can just kind of go off, uh, and, and watch the videos. Is there, you know, the, the, you have the rod grip choosing that. That sounds like there's a pretty standard one that you're going to use. That was the, that was the half wells or the full wells. Uh, sorry, reverse half wells. Reverse half wells. Okay. That's the pretty common one. And then, you know, for you, you know, what do you enjoy building? I mean, talking about bamboo versus graphite versus, uh, you know, fiberglass, which one, if you had to pick one, would you, if you had to only build one, what would you do? Ah, that's a great question. Um, I really enjoy restoring bamboo rods. Um, they're a ton of work. And so that might, you know, and uh, not be the best place to start. Mm-hmm. But I would probably start on either fiberglass um, because they're short and you don't have to wrap as many guides to kind of get started. Oh, okay. Uh, yep. Or graphite. Yeah, I yeah. would say probably start on a fiberglass or graphite rod. Okay. And is there any other resources? You know, we've talked about this, that you obviously have a ton of resources. Um, but another, you know, out there online that you would recommend for some boy, oh, you mentioned the guy up in Alaska with the bamboo. Are there any other ones you'd recommend to somebody if they wanted to dig into rod building a little more? Um, I would probably direct people just to YouTube right now. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of, I feel like a lot of the resources have come become decentralized, uh, but again, centralized in a place like YouTube. So, yeah. um, so if you yeah, just go up, so if you just go up and uh, go into YouTube and just type in, you know, rod building, you know, handle, real seat, it'll pop up some videos. And how do you d- dig through that as far as, you know, because there must be some stuff that maybe isn't as good. That does it really matter? Do you just start watching somebody and go with it? Yeah, for sure. That's always an issue in YouTube, right? Yeah. Um, in part, that's why I started my, my kind of video tutorial series, just because I um I had looked at a number of videos and originally I was just going to kind of piece together a number of videos that people had done to make tutorials. Um, but, uh, so I tried and I, I'll let, you know, people judge whether that's success, whether it's successful or not, but to kind of take the best of what I found online and put those together in a video series that's or it. a couple of video series. Yeah. I think you're doing, I think you're doing well. I just, uh, I typed in that rod building real seat and, you know, some, I think uh, mud hole, I'm not sure who mud hole is, but, um, there's a couple yeah. of, you know, get bit outdoors. So there's a few, yeah. that, oh, you know, and those are more, um, I think those are more gear rods and then, then you're right there. Yeah. You're, you're, um, rod building, installing and aligning the real seat. So you've got some content that comes up high on, on YouTube. So that's great. Excellent. So, uh, so it looks like you're doing well there and, uh, cool. Well, that's, that's, uh, that should cover that. And then what about, you know, we talked a little bit about rod action, but again, on your rod. So maybe we can just tie back to that. So are your rods or where are all these coming from? And, and I mean, you have the different rods, obviously the, you know, if you're going to source these things, where, where are they coming from? Are they different areas or? They are. Yeah. I, I, I work with, uh, I think it's right now four different uh, blank manufacturers mm-hmm. and that's, it's always changing. You know, that's the thing. Oh, really? with, um, suppliers, it's constant change, constant kind of, 
uh, flux in various markets and the type of graphite and the type of fiberglass that's being used. So, okay. um, but I try, you know, I try to keep my prices low because I want the, I want people to give it a shot. You know, it's a ton of fun and I don't want to sell blanks that are kind of cost prohibitive for a lot of people, especially if you're just starting out. Right. Um, well, what would a so, blank, if you're just to buy a blank, uh, you know, from a rod blank, cause I know, um, I had, um, oh gosh, um, I'm drawing a blank, but the St. Croix, one of the St. Croix reps on, and I remember back in the day we used to use St. Croix blanks. That were some of the blanks we built the rods with. And, yeah. um, and he, and I mentioned, and I asked them about blank. So like, where can we just go to your site? And they don't actually even sell them on their site anymore. There's another site that actually sells, I think their stuff and some other stuff. So are these, I mean, most of your blanks are coming from overseas. Is that kind of where they're all coming from? Or is there any U S based stuff or right now they're all overseas, but, um, I'm in moving in the direction of, uh, of having some domestic blanks produced too. Mm-hmm. So I hope to have those out maybe a year, might be a little bit longer. So, yep. Yeah. And is yeah, that, that, that seems like that's always the, uh, you know, again, well, there's obviously tons of, uh, big major, uh, companies that are, you know, getting tons of stuff overseas. So there's no, nothing wrong with that at all. But, but yeah, th- th- there is a little bit of a movement for people to try to maybe get stuff, you know, U S based, but it just seems like, yeah, like you said, it's cost prohibitive, it, you know, to get the same blank, you know, it's just kind of that, that's the challenge, right? To some extent it is. And, you know, the technology is really leveled out. So oh, um, really? So you're not going to get a huge difference of uh, kind of U.S. made versus overseas on, on the tech stuff. That's right, especially when it comes to graphite. Now, I think with fiberglass, um, you can get pretty niche with some real small kind of custom builders in the U.S. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, you know, uh, you can get a phenomenal blank uh, for under 100 bucks. There you and, go. There you go. So under hundred bucks and, and yeah, I'm just kind of searching here. I just want to check on this so I don't, uh, I can remember it's, um, uh, let's see. Yeah. Oh, just a re- yeah. Dan Johnston, uh, from, from, uh, St. Croix. Uh, okay. that's the episode. I think it was episode 75 where we got into some of this and, you know, I was asking him those questions about, you know, again, because there are a lot, lots of great rods out there, many different companies and what separates, you know, them from the rest. And he basically said, there's a, just a ton of great companies out there. Um, but they have, you know, kind of complete control over the process. And, and I think Tom Rosenbauer, when I had him on talking about, you know, kind of the Orvis, you know, and, and, or the rods are there, that's their main thing as well. Um, yeah. And the same thing, they, you know, they got these kind of complete control. So if they want to make changes, you know, they can do it. But, but again, that's, that's the thing that, that, you know, even myself, I'm out there. Am I, am I going to notice the difference between these subtle differences between these rods, you know, and I don't know, I, I might not, I mean, especially a beginner or somebody who's intermediate, they probably would never even tell a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I think probably, you know, 90 plus percent people it might not be able to tell the difference once exactly. you get on the Yep. So yeah. that's cool. All right. Good yeah. stuff. Well, no, it sounds like you have an affordable package and, and what is the package? So if I'm going to get into a, you know, uh, so this Euro, let's go back to this Euro nymph rod, um, the graphite, and I guess that one maybe is a little bit more expensive, but what is the, the, the cost for that package to get the whole thing? So I can just get everything ready to go and just watch your videos and build it. Sure. Uh, so the component kit's going to run anywhere from, uh, for a shorter fiberglass rod, like 130 all the way up to like a full spay rod, which I think is just under 200 for the, you know, the blank, the grip, the components, everything you need there. And then there's a couple different options as far as um, the tools and epoxies and glues like that. But I think you're looking in like the 60 to $70 range for that. So, okay. all right. uh, you know, it could be under 200 maximum. Yep. And you're looking at like around 250 or so. Sure. There you go. So yeah. in the 200, two to three, a few hundred dollar range, you know, under that for, you know, the whole thing, literally you could build the whole rod and, and when you're done, you're going to have a custom rod. And, and these days really, I mean, 200 bucks, that's, I mean, yeah, you're talking, that's, that's already at the, you know, there's plenty of uh rods you could pay thousand, you know, a thousand dollars or more for. So, so absolutely. Yeah. So this is pretty, yep. pretty awesome deal. And, um, well, good. That's, um, yeah, I think that covers a good chunk of what I was going to, anything else you want to throw out there as far as, 
you know, what we missed here for somebody that's maybe going to build that first rod or maybe they have a rod, old rod they want to kind of upgrade as far as, you know, tips or anything that they should know? Sure. Yeah. I'd say just, you know, give it a try, right? You're not going to hurt anything by kind of uh, working on an older rod. Um, you know, we're always available here. You can give us a call, send us a text, email, whatever works for you to answer questions mm -hmm. before you get started. If you have kind of a rod that, you know, has some sentimental or, or, or value um, otherwise. Um, but yeah, we're happy to help and okay. uh, it's a great hobby. I think you'd really enjoy it. Cool. Well, I'll definitely let you know on you know, on, on how my little uh, process goes here. I, uh, before I let you get out of here, I got a quick little super quick rapid fire round, just some random questions. Um, do you have it just a couple more minutes here? I do. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what is your, maybe you can talk about first, I guess, do you, maybe that was kind of your, your elevator pitch, but do you have one for, you know, your, you know, somebody wants to hear, you know, what is your elevator pitch for somebody to, to get them in to sell them on, on your product? Um, what, what is that? What does that sound like? I probably don't have an elevator pitch. <laughs> I've never been really good at that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and uh, who are, and maybe before you get there or if you, either way, if you can't get there, but you know, um, who is your, your, I don't know, your target audience or who are the, do, do you have that in your mind? Who are the people that are buying? Are these mostly complete be beginners? Are these mostly, uh, you know, kind of rebuilding rods? Who, who, do you know who that is? Yeah, I work with really the full spectrum. So um, I, th I get a, I take a lot of calls from people each week that are just getting started or just want to get started. And then I work with uh, a number of professional builders around the world. So I really, I try to cover the full spectrum. You know, we offer kits that are pretty affordable. And then we also offer, you know, really high end products uh, like handmade agate guides that, you know, we ship worldwide. Oh, wow. Oh, no kidding. You ship stuff uh, out all over the world as well. Just the, so a big part is you're shipping the components and stuff as well. These unique and like real seats, right? You can get all sorts of probably hundreds of different types of wood. Is that also something you get into? Um, yeah, we do. Yep. We, um, we do pretty good with real seats. Um, agates have been something we brought on a few years ago and we have those handmade in Europe no and, kidding. Uh, and yeah, they've been great. Wow. Agate. That's uh, yeah, that sounds amazing. So yeah, again, we could look at some of this stuff, get a idea what that looks like, um, from your site. Okay. So, so I guess here's my, uh, a, a quick little rapid here. So, and you, well, I guess first thing home river, what do you, what would be your home river now and, and kind of the species you, you go for mostly? Uh, home river would be the cold water river in Michigan Okay. and, uh, yeah, probably brown and rainbow trout. Okay. And does that, the cold water, does that have a steelhead at all? Or is that this kind of a smaller Creek? It does not. Yeah. It's pretty small for steelhead. I'd say we fish the grand and the rogue river. Oh, the rogue river. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. cool. Uh, Matt, that's, that's about all I have for you. Uh, in the next, um, six to 12 months, is there anything, uh, you know, upcoming for you personally or, or the, uh, the business that you want to let us know what's going on? Uh, we have some new blanks coming out. We have an 11 foot, uh, check nymphing blank. And then we have a, a couple shorter, uh, fiberglass blanks that are coming out that we're pretty excited about. Mm -hmm. Those will hopefully be shipping, uh, next week and should be up on the site, uh, probably mid June or so. Oh, nice. Nice. And, and yeah. do you do, the website looks really, uh, really clean. Um, is that something that you're doing yourself or is that, do you have somebody doing that for you? No, I do all the work myself. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I've always been a big fan of kind of Scandinavian design principles. So trying to keep things streamlined and, you know, clean and easy to find. There you go. Like, uh, you and Ikea, right? Is that their uh, <laughs> inspiration? <right>. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Cool. So, and then if they want to find you, just um, proofflyfishing.com is the best, best place if anybody has questions or whatever. Absolutely. Yep. And my phone number's on the site. Same with email. So, you know, feel free to reach out and contact me anytime. Perfect. All right, Matt. Well, I want to thank you for coming on and, and sharing the uh, the tips and just kind of going through the process here because, uh, you know, I'm sure some people maybe, you know, maybe some people have thought about it and, and want to get into it. So if, if they uh, if they do, we'll direct them your way. And um, yeah, if, if I have any questions along my uh, my journey as well, I'll, I'll check in with you. So uh, yeah, I just want to thank you for coming on and sharing your wisdom. Yeah, thank you. Nice speaking with you. All right. See you, Matt. All right. Bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash proof. Head over to the member site at wetflyswing.com slash members to go deeper with the podcast and your journey. Find out how to connect with uh, proof fly fishing and uh, some special discounts 
and get started uh, with your first uh, rod building package. Just go to wetflyswing.com slash members uh, to get started today. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show. I look forward to catching up with you soon. Maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.